Awesome. Let's go. Yay. <laughs> so many people came. This is great. Uh, hopefully we'll have a few more trickling in. So that's fine. So we have um, a little, this is mostly a mental exercise. This is something that if you've done other mini courses and classes with me, I might have asked you to do before, which is great. Because I think every time you do this exercise, it gets more interesting and more um, special. So the assignment has two parts. Draw a circle, draw the inside of your head. <laughs> and this is it's intentionally a little bit zen. It's intentionally vague. Um, and I really just want to get us into our interoceptive sense. Um, and so about me, my name is Eleanor Schnarr. Yes. Sorry, it is an S. Tom was right. I had to tell it you. I knew you'd want to know that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would bug you. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> okay, take two. Um, so I'm Eleanor Schnarr. I have an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and an MA from the Graduate Theological Union with a certificate in Swedenborgian Studies and a certificate in Dharma Studies with an emphasis on uh, yoga. I um, have studied a, a tradition called Shaiva Siddhanta, which is one of the major South Indian forms of yoga for um, years now. And um, it's something that I love. So I really work at this place in between Swedenborgianism and Eastern religion, and neuroscience and art. And um, this talk is kind of an overview, like a conceptual overview of a lot of the things that I've been working on. So this is very um, going to be a very abstract talk. It's going to be a very philosophical talk. And the first part, I'm going to talk a lot about um, cognitive neuroscience. I'm going to talk a lot about Swedenborg, and I'm talk going to talk specifically about answering the question, what does Swedenborg mean by internal? It's this word that he uses a lot. Um, and when we think about this idea of interiority, what does that mean on kind of a few different levels? Um, and what does that have to do with our senses? And what does that have to do with like how we perceive language and stories and ourselves? So I, uh, I, I'm calling kind of the title of the book that I'm writing, I should say, um, and the title of this lecture is Sacred Systems of Interoception. And so what I mean by this is a, it's a system which primarily relies on the interoceptive sense, on our sense of what's inside of us, um, or subjectively perceived internal embodied energy our sense of being alive. What do we perceive when we go inward? And I, I locked on really early to this quote by this yogi named Sri Sri Ananda Murti. And this means the form of bliss. Yes. Uh, and uh, so the nadis, which means streams, the, the streams of energy that we perceive when we look inward, um, the nadis are streams of perceptual energy. So there's something about perception. So we're not just we're not just looking at hard science. We're looking at what do what have people seen in the past when they look inward? How does our self perception work, and how does our self perception become a spiritual tool for our own betterment? Um, and there are lots of systems that <laughs> embody this sense or uh, engage this sense. Um, so some of some that we can talk about, we can talk about Reiki from Japan, we can talk about Shigong from China, um, we can talk about Ashtanga Yoga, which uh, is with eight limb yoga, um, and we can talk about internal breathing and swing versions of ideas of interiority. And uh, please stop me, I ramble. If I, if you know, if you want to go over something, please talk, I want this to be um, an engaged. Uh, Eleanor. Someone in the chat just wants to know how much time they have for the art prompt. Um, we have 40 minutes. Okay, there you go. So, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes it's just blank. <laughs> so however long it takes. And I hope that you work on this, on this prompt all your life. Um, so we're not talking about introspection. We're talking about interoception. Um, 
So <laughs> this is not the action of looking inward. It is the perception of what is inward when you look inward. It's oh. the assumption that there is something there that this is a sensory modality in the same way that our external senses are. And so much of New Church history has centered around the doctrinal argument over what is sometimes called the Dutch position. And I was raised in the Lord's New Church, and I'm not gonna go too much into that. This is kind of the, where this argument comes from. Um, the idea that not only does the Bible and scriptures in general have an internal sense, as Swedenborg proposes, but that Swedenborg's own writings are also written, written correspondentially and then should therefore be interpreted internally, should be interpreted as allegory. Um, my own position takes this argument a step further, um, and I say uh, that the internal sense is evident in sacred texts around the world. Because interoception, is it, gonna, is it gonna not let me read my own slide? Don't, All right. don't say anything first. Yeah. <laughs> because interoception <laughs> is a fundamental different. function of consciousness. Yeah, I don't, and I don't think I can move the captions. I try, I um, try to. But the point, the point is that interoception is something fundamental in human consciousness because it's something fundamental in the way that our brains work, and that shows up in religion. So as in quotes, I may or may not be able to read. Um, so Arcana Celestia 6305 says, even if a person does not have heavenly love present in him, but hellish love, the inmost center of his life still owes its existence to heavenly love. For this love flows in constantly from the Lord and provides them with a vital heat in its primary and original form. But as it comes to that person, it is perverted by him, and this gives rise to hellish love from which an unclean heat is radiated. So our suffering, our hell, our evil is this external thing. And when in these types of worship, what you're doing is you're going into your own interior space to have access to that divine fountain. Uh, the relationship between the natural and spiritual sense of the word is like that of the body and the soul. The literal sense being like the body, the internal sense being like the soul. Just as the body lives by means of the soul, so does the literal sense by means of the internal sense. By way of the internal sense, the Lord's life flows into the letter according to the affection of the person reading it. This shows how holy the word is though it does not seem so horribly mine. So we have in the first one, we have we're all, we have hell all around us and we go, we go inward. And what we find is that, that that internal light is flowing out just like it does in the word, it's doing this in ourselves. It's flowing out into our external reality. And then he goes on and he says, I have been shown the nature of the heavenly form as it exists in its most infinite, in, intimate sphere, intima, lowest. Um, it was like the form taken by the churning circumvolutions, which are visible in human brains. So as we go upward, we're going inward into our bodies. We're going into deeper and deeper levels of our sensorium. And then, so this is, these are all our celestia, so late 1720s. This is the five senses, so it's probably five, 10 years earlier. And so before he's getting to all of this stuff about the internal sense of the word, he says this, the external senses give life to the body for they are the external organs and sensories of it, or sight, hearing, but the internal senses give life to the superior mind. <laughs> For they are its internal organs and sensory of it. But the internal senses give life to the superior mind, for they are its internal organs. In these later, mm -hmm. the understanding and the will, the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, me, as do sensation and action in the body. And we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit more about the nervous system. For understanding is higher than sensating. For the understanding is furnished by the inferior organs, 
And he doesn't mean less good, he means lower down in the system. Um, and sensates according to their information. That's in place of sense is understanding and in place of action is will. They change their names in a superior sphere or in every superior degree. And pay attention to this because in the pre theological works, Swedenborg says this over and over and over again mm -hmm. that he can, one thing is going to be stated in a certain way in one degree, and then it's going to be the same idea stated in a different way in a higher degree. So when we're moving from sciencey Swedenborg to spiritual Swedenborg, He's saying the same things in different ways because he's speaking in higher degrees. So he doesn't just repeat himself, does he? <laughs> Actually, he does, but he repeats himself like this. <laughs> what, what? He repeats himself like a spiral. Uh, and our senses, so this is my favorite Swedenborg quote. This is it, this is the one. Read it with me, read it with me. In the, the most, most perfect, perfect and perpetual spiral, the center is where the periphery and radius are, and the radius and periphery where the center is. Oh dear. Yeah. Oh. oh dear. <laughs> That's some quantum oh, yeah. physics. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how he describes the geometry of the mind that it's this, this, uh, this golden spiral, it's this perpetual hand. Um, Joyce Barker says golden ratio Fibonacci. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so it, the golden ratio is a perfect way to it visualize uh, a perfect and perpetual spiral because that's what it is. And it's also this infinite this infinite string of, of non-repeating numbers. So it can be seen as a representation for the whole universe because any mm -hmm. numerical representation that you could assign to the universe will be somewhere in the spiral. So this is how our minds work. This is how our minds structure reality <coughs> according to Swedenborg is that we have these repeating fractal layers of meaning and when we are talking about the difference between the external sense and the internal sense, we're talking about the difference between this line here and this line here. And they echo and they talk to each other, even though I could say that the numerical value in any given chunk of this has infinite difference from any other chunk because, the, because it's an infinite number. And, and yet they reflect. Mm -hmm. So, what is the interoceptive system, interoceptive system in the brain according to contemporary neuroscience? So, this is a quote, um, which I did not put the citation on the slide. I'm very sorry. But if you look up A.D. Craig and the insula, you'll find this paper. Um, so, it turns out what we found in the last 10 ish years, is that just like we have organs for vision and organs for hearing, we have organs for interoception. We have these little green, these green nerve paths um, are nerves which are specialized for transmitting interoceptive information. So this is very mundane stuff. This is feeling your heart racing. This is feeling that you're hungry, need to go to the bathroom. Um, you know, feeling when you fill your lungs all the way. You know, very anatomical, like this is what's happening inside my body. So what they found out when they studied the parts of the brain where these nerves go, which is, I'm primarily gonna talk about the insula, but it's also, the anterior cingulate cortex. But it's these kind of more interior structures of the brain. Like, and if you look, this part up here is where we have representation of the surface of the body. But then as the brain itself tucks inward, 
you have a representation of the inside of the body. And this fold and this fold are something which become more um, obvious and more evident in Homo sapiens because Homo sapiens have that extra cortical space which needs to fold inward. So we have this dramatic difference in the way that our brains are set up between what's inside me and what's outside me. And this has incredible um, psychological meaning. Uh, and so we go to, go to the, the Craig paper and what they say is that activation in the anterior insula, that's this place right here, correlates directly with subjective feelings from the body and strikingly with all emotional feelings. These findings appear to signify a posterior to anterior sequence of increasingly homeostatically efficient representations that integrate all salient neural activity. So the brain is bringing together neural activity into the part of it that says what's inside of me. Um, culminating in network nodes in the right and left interior insuli that may be organized asymmetrically in an opponent fashion, the interior insula is appropriate characteristics to support this proposal that in, engenders a cinemascopic model of human awareness and subjectivity. It's appropriate. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the feeling that I own myself, that what is in here is somehow connected to my sense of self, my sense of emotional well being, my internal spiritual state, as Swedenborg might, might put it. So, as Swedenborg says, the brain <coughs> is the most intimate form of heaven. Hmm. So how do we strengthen the interoceptive sense? Keep me on track for time. Oh, yeah. So we have till 1045. So we're at 10 minutes of 10. So you got 50 minutes, though. Okay. Um, so how do we strengthen the interoceptive sense? We strengthen it like we strengthen any sense. So the brain assigns cortical real estate um, to parts of the brain in response to usage. Uh, when one sense organ is not being used, it takes about 40 minutes for its cortical areas to start reacting to other forms of stimuli. It takes 40 minutes for your brain to change how it's organized. Um, and this is one of my favorite studies of all time. Again, I'm not being a good academic. I don't have my citations on the slide, but um, <laughs> this is a wonderful study. They put, um, <laughs> they put cited probably, you know, 19 year old white men um, into an fMRI scanner, blindfolded them and gave them a tactile task. And they monitor what parts of their cortex were being activated. And they found that this, and this is what they discovered, is that so when you meditate, when you watch a movie, when you, and they think that this actually has something to do with why we dream, because our brains change so much that if our visual systems were shut down for a third of our life, they wouldn't work as well. So they have to activate to keep um, working. Say that again. They think that neuroplasticity, this is completely theoretical. Okay. But so when you look at someone dreaming, there is a, they call it the dream network that goes from areas in your brain stem and basically only activates the visual cortex. This is why if you're trying to wake yourself up from a dream, you activate in other sense. That's not, and so you complicate it because your dreams are going to be mostly, mostly happening back here and kind of the more conscious, analytical, like actually awake parts of your brain that take a lot more energy to get going um, are going to be asleep. And so if what they think is that if we slept the amount that we needed, and had our and had no input to our visual system because all your other sensory systems still get input when you're asleep, um, and that your visual systems would actually theoretical but cool. 
Interesting. Interesting. What's up? So um, if you're having a lucid dream yeah. and you're trying like the Dickens to wake up the, and it takes a while, yeah. the issue is that it's, this is still asleep. Yeah. It's that, it's that, and different, there's like hypnagogia, which Swedenborg experiments with a lot, which is the hallucinations that you have when you're going in and out of sleep. And that, and that happens because there's like a few different kind of chemical systems that have to get going for you to get to go through the waking and sleeping cycle okay. and they'll get activated in the wrong order. Wow. So your body won't be able, like there's, there's one thing that like paralyzes you yeah. from the neck down when you're asleep. So you don't move around a lot. Okay. You lose sleep walk. That's not working. Uh, or the opposite. If you're having like sleep paralysis, it's that that's not turning off and your dreams keep going. So you get these vivid hallucinations that people will have right if they're waking and sleeping. So what's the implication for meditation? So the implication for meditation is that you should be meditating for at least 40 minutes. For at least 40 oh minutes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. That's what and, and, when you're, and when you're meditating, so when we consciously spend time meditating on the interior parts of our awareness, the sense becomes strengthened. Um, and so this was the motivation behind my exploration of interoceptive painting, which is kind of going to be the, um, the next part of this. So I started trying to visualize this. Can sense. I ask you something? Yeah. With meditation, does it have to be like a like? Because I know some people like everyone meditates differently, mm -hmm. right? So is there like a specific way to meditate? Is there like a, you know what I mean? Like some people like think sit and think they're meditating, but like yeah. like how would you learn that skill to exercise that there particular are, piece? Obviously, there are many, but one of the things that I'm I'm going to talk about is um where we have um this is one of the one of the reasons why i love yoga uh -huh. it's because that's exactly what it's doing it's like it's saying you have all of these this kind of internal awareness but you don't have anything objective that you can point to to be like like if if both of us see a piece of paper and we can both point to that and say that's externally a piece of paper if i'm talking about my heart chakra then I have to rely on your experience that you are also having an internal experience. And so there's a spiritual closeness that we're having, yeah. but there is nothing you can look at in the external world mm -hmm. as like as, as evidence of this. And so we have these systems from all over the world that are giving us structures and languages that organize what's happening internally. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a yogi, so that's immediately where my heart goes, but even, you know, paying attention to breath. Yeah. I have a question too about the meditation. Yeah. So in my church, we've had a couple of different people offering different types of meditation at the same time they would rotate, mm -hmm. but then they both got to this point that they wanted the rest of us to choose one or the other, saying that it was better to focus on one style as opposed to mixing it up. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, but I also am a serial style learner. Um, <laughs> serial. <laughs> but it's, I mean, and, and, it's, and it's kind of like religion. Like we can, we can, I love syncretism, <laughs> but you're, you're, what you're syncretizing are systems that are complete independently. Like you can't, you can't, sublimate one to the other. You can't sublimate one um, religious system to the other. Like I, I, you know, I could say, and people do, and I'm not, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to necessarily put like a judgment call on this, but you know, I've heard example. Um, there's a, I love Norse mythology. There's a book written by a Swedenborgian about the correspondences of Norse mythology. Whoa. And um, I've done the same thing. You should watch some of my sermons. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what she does is she takes the correspondences <coughs> from the Bible and interprets it through a biblical lens. And which means that it's no longer able to stand on its own. And so, what I really like about this approach is we're saying that there's something in our cognitive physiological apparatus 
that sees things as internals and externals. And so you can then approach a correspondential allegorical interpretation of another, um, of another religious system and saying this is both going back to the body. It's not going back to another scripture. Um, and I like that a lot better because, you know, if you're going to engage with religion, you have to give it the strength to stand on its own. And it's the same thing with the meditation thing, where it's like it, it exists and to respect it is to say that this has, you know, holistic universal access on the same level as this other one. So, you know, so you can study both of them, but you have to study them with the, the acknowledgement that they both have access to everything. <coughs> and, you know, I think when you're first learning and first kind of diving deep, deep into something, it is, you know, very beneficial to just choose one and um, really experience it deeply. Are you talking about the spiritual body? Yeah. Which? Yours. <laughs> what, about the, what about the physical body? Um, they are, so I can go into uh, like the, the step from Descartes to Swedenborg. So Rene Descartes is 100 years before Swedenborg. And he's all about the pineal gland. He thought the pineal gland was the seat of the soul and that the cerebrum wasn't doing anything. And so he's, if I go back to... No, I was just thinking of the spiritual world with spiritual bodies in it. So if I go back to our spiral, Descartes is all like, there's nothing out here. He's all, he's all in here because he looks at the brain and he says the pineal gland is the geometric center of the brain. Swedenborg, so he's kind of like this. Swedenborg is like this. So he uses that word intimate, or the wrong quote. Um, and the arcana, he, yes, uses, yes. He, uses, he uses that word, that word intimate. And so when we're talking about a correspondential relationship, we're talking about a conversation. And a conversation which is taking place not just you know, at, at the center point, but at every center point. And so you have this kind of distributed like quantum foam almost, where every, every point of, of consciousness and every point of um, atomic reality, I should have brought in his, his atomic sketches here, because um, I would have answered your question better, um, is connected through like a, a, a spiral geometry that's almost non-local. So it's a different kind of relationship, but there's still a distinction. But do we have a spiritual head as well, a spiritual brain? Yeah. Which one did you want us to, 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 to draw? I <laughs> the only one you can. No, the other one is very similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the exercise. There's a um, question on Zoom for you. Yeah. Can you reference the book on Swedenborg and Norse correspondence? Yes. I love Good Norse. Google. It's by Audrey Oner. Oh, ho, ho. I'm, it was written at about uh, like the 40s or 50s. Wow. Um, not a big um, I don't, I don't, I don't really like her method. Um, because it, again, I think she she relies on the Bible too much and doesn't doesn't let it doesn't doesn't assume that you know the Hindus call it twilight language which is this uh, intentionally writing something in obscure esoteric symbolism so that people who are more deeply spiritually invested are going to be able to see something that a lay person might not um, correspondences. What was the book though? I'm trying to find, I wanna like give the people in the chat um, um, the actual. I think the exact title is, uh, they Googled like Audrey Odner correspondences and there's yep, nothing. It's very obscure. And if you want a copy, I would recommend going to Bernatham Library. Um, I, I don't remember the exact title, but it, it's like, the, it's like Norse mythology or some very generic title. Um, but it's, uh, 
it's not it's not an easy book to get, it, get your hands on. Sweet book connects to Greek mythology. Greeks don't have elves. <laughs> so let's go back to this one. So, so sorry, I'm, people really want to know about this. Book. Uh, <laughs> they want you to spell. What's can anyone spell her name? Yeah. If maybe if you write her name, I can maybe find yeah. at least yeah. find it online. Yep. 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 So it's ah. Uh, Oh, that's how I was spelling it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I I would be very surprised if you can find it online. Well, I just even the name of it, even like anything about it. I, I it could be like stories of stories of Norse mythology or Norse myths or like something like that. Um, yeah. I'll, I didn't. Right. I didn't have it in kind of my my stack of references on the top of my head for the stock. I'm very sorry. No, no, it's okay. I don't want to derail your whole presentation. <laughs> <Sorry. but it's laughs> right. Multiple people in the chat that wanted to know. I'm very interested. <laughs> I would I would refer you to the librarians of Bernathan College or Michael Yoff. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And I'll, I'll spell it for them in the chat. And <laughs> Michael Yoff is at CSS. Yeah. Michael, um, yeah. he might he might where to get a copy of it. Uh, okay, yeah. so you got it's it. Very, yeah. like, okay, perfect. And you're so, at um, it's ten oh six. Okay, so um, I got really interested very early on at kind of creating imagery, creating artwork um, from the interoceptive sense. And so these are a few kind of early attempts. Um, and then I got really <laughs> interested in yoga as an interoceptive um, system. Uh, and particularly, I got interested in this word pratyahara, um, which means interoception. And as you go through the stages when you're doing the eight limb yoga, you're going from the most external, just shun evil, stop doing bad things. Uh, niyama, start doing good actions, and then you get into your body, and then you get into your breathing, and then you get into your perception, and then you get into your focus in your mind, and then you get into your stillness, and then you transcend everything. Um, and so I think, I think, I think like there's this really beautiful relationship between Swedenborgianism and yoga, um, and I think it's really based on, you can have completely different theologies, completely different mythologies, but they both go back to the body. They both go back to there's something here. There's something about the way you're breathing. There's something about the way your senses are working that's directly connecting you to the spiritual world. And with Swedenborg, I think I, you know, I, I threw this in at the, the slide in a, at the last minute, but I think it's very important to recognize that when you can become aware of your senses, when you become aware of how your senses are working, you're gonna start becoming aware of the places where your senses kind of cross and interact and become complicated. And so when Sweden works talking about the external sense and the internal sense or the external senses and the internal senses, we can directly kind of experience this on a very physiological level by thinking about like, if, if I have the letter A and I associate the letter A with the color red, then that's telling me something that's happening in my brain. That's something telling me something that's happening within my own internal state of awareness that's not influenced by anything outside. And so I think synesthesia is a very, very powerful tool for getting us back into um, our sense of awareness because it's telling us what's happening from inside our brain. And then uh, this is just kind of a, a, an interesting place that you can go with this. Uh, so this is the two slit experiment. And you can think of synesthesia, you can think of the interoceptive sense in general as something that's very closely related to uh, feedback patterns. And what they think is that um, when you have a synesthetic experience, when you have an, an experience that's coming from 
inside the system. Why don't you explain synesthesia? Synesthesia is, can I not define it? No. Um, synesthesia is um, the blending of the senses. Um, and specifically, it's the place where, um, where the distinction that we have between external modalities goes away. And what I mean by that, so the, the most common form of synesthesia is, is what's called graphene color synesthesia, which is the association between a graphene, which is a letter or a number, with a color. So I could say the letter A is perceptually red, even though there's no external thing that's triggering that. This. And what they think causes synesthesia is that when we are infants, our brains are wholly disorganized and our kind of cortical, the, the cognitive part of our brain, that's the surface area of our brain is much thicker and much more interwoven. And then as we get more sensory input into the system, it becomes pruned. And all those connections get thinner and thinner and thinner until you're just, until you just have what's, what's, um, what you're, what your experiences have dictated. And this is how trauma works. That oh. you get, because they say that uh, neurons that wire together, wire together. And this is something that Swedenborg understood intuitively. And when he goes through his work on the brain, he is um, very, very aware that what you experience is going to affect your physiological structure, and then that's going to affect your behavior. And that was a hundred years before his time. The next person to say that was Sigmund Freud. Wow. Ah. So, so did you say neurons that fire together, wire together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a great little, yeah. There's a, there, there, are, there are a few of those also, uh, nasal respirations and trained limbic oscillations. In train, in train limbic oscillation. Yeah. So when you when you yeah. breathe through your nose, this is another thing that Swedenborg discovered. When you breathe through your nose, it's affecting your pituitary mucosa, yeah. which is what's kind of on top of your nasal cavity and your pituitary gland. What Swedenborg discovered, and this is the difference between Descartes and Swedenborg. Um, Descartes all about the pineal gland because the pineal gland is the geometric center of the back of the brain. Swedenborg. It's all about the pituitary gland. And most of us probably know the pituitary gland is like the one that affects how you grow and you develop. That's not what he discovered. What he discovered was that when you breathe, it's being kind of massaged like this through the nose. Through the nose. Um, so there's something special about nasal breathing that entrains limbic oscillation which means the electrical oscillations that are happening in your limbic system, which is the, the inner, like interior, interior part of your brain and your emotional part of your brain, your, your kind of deepest, deepest emotional self is all happening through the mechanism of breath. Wow. Uh, um, Joyce on Zoom is asking, how would he discover that? Uh, he, so there was a guy named Thomas Willis, um, from whom we get the arch of Willis, which is one of the major vascular structures in the bottom of the brain. And Thomas Willis was an engraver. And just like today, we've been gifted with much better imaging technology with like fMRIs and stuff. At that time, their imaging technology was the ability to actually dissect a brain out of its housing um, without destroying it because it's very fragile. Um, and then to have the ability to reproduce what would then be like high def images. And so Swedenborg <clears throat> had a copy of Thomas Willis's book of anatomical engravings. And that was his primary resource that he used and so he was able to see anatomical structures. So he wasn't the first person to like draw them or like see them. He was the first person to look at this blob of mush that is the human brain and see order and understand that this is a harmonic organ. 
Um, and he doesn't, he's before Luigi Galvani. Um, so he is, uh, he doesn't have the word electricity. What he says is, and this is all the way back in tremulations when he's about 30. He says, I, I did a deep study into the human brain and I have concluded that nerve fibers uh, form these, these oscillating patterns, these vibratory patterns, according to uh, tremulations <laughs> as fast as lightning. So he doesn't have electricity, he does have tremulations as fast as lightning, which then become spiritus fluids, uh, fluctis spiritis, spirit juices, um, or the, the, the influx of breath. The spirities, it's respiration. Um, so you can you can kind of laugh at it and be like, oh yeah, you know, spirit fluid, spirit juice. <laughs> but it's no, so so fluxes flow current breath. So the 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 currents which are formed mm -hmm. from breathing, which is much closer to a modern explanation. Um, you have about a half an hour left. Wonderful, fantastic. Awesome. Okay, good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Um, so this is a quote from the Rig Veda. The long-haired one is said to gaze full on heaven. The long-haired one is said to be that light. That's, um, that's twilight, right? Yeah, but it's talking about yogis. I mean, this is from uh, the Keshen Hem, which is the first historical place that we get evidence of yogis, and this is what it says about them. It's this. This person who's gazing full on heaven. So they're outward looking and to be that light. So it's the, the interior reflecting the exterior. Or, you know, and I love thinking about the two slit experiment and then making it your skull. Not scientific at all, but fun. Um, and this idea that we are taking an energy from the, the external world, and then there's something else that reflects inside of us. That's this non-local light. That's this, this, this part of us that's connected to the whole universe. It's not really in space. Um, so, yeah, um, we, can, we can talk about more, but I want to uh, talk about the chakra system. So the chakra system is, and these are the chakras according to Shiva Siddhanta. These are the chakras according to Yogananda who uses Patanjali. Um, so there's seven, uh, there's seven point systems and there's nine point systems and there's three point systems. Um, and they exist all over India, and there's all sorts of yogis who will claim that their way is best. Um, they're trying to tell you something. Uh, <laughs> but I think that the best way is a way of looking at all the ways, and a way of understanding all the ways and seeing how it makes sense. Um, so what we have is we have a way of looking into our own bodies and associating Different, different sensory mechanisms together. So it's taking advantage of synesthesia because every, um, every chakra point has different, um, different modalities that it's, that it's associated with. They have, uh, they have colors, they have sounds, they have mantras, um, and all of those external signifiers are kind of unified in the interior space and then associated with some abstract quality of the mind. So, you know, the we talk about kind of your values in your sacral chakra, your creativity in your sacral chakra, your 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 fire, it's manipura, your, your gut, your, your your rage, your passion is here, and you feel it here. And then your heart. And what's it? And what's the difference of loving something with your gut and loving something with your heart? The mind, the the, the understanding or wisdom. Right. And and so every place you're having a different level of engagement. You're having a different spiritual society that you're pulling into you according to you know your vibration, your according <laughs> to your state. Um, and so we have. 
layers. Like all the way back at the beginning, we have, we have degrees and ways of talking about something. So I can talk about spiritual societies. I can talk about entities on Mars. I can talk about Shiva and Shakti. I can talk about all of these mythological figures. And they're all true on one level of that spiral. But there's something about having an access to the actual curvature of the spiral that tells us that there is going to be all of these different layers. And then that gives us the, the ability <coughs> to code switch. And so we can code switch between talking about the Bible and talking about the Gita and talking about science, when we're all actually talking about love and wisdom. So I have quotes and I have paintings. <laughs> these are my paintings. And I wanted to, so I, I have all of that. And then, <laughs> and then uh, I wanted to walk you through how I've been processing some of this over the year. Let the mind strive to discern the object within. Experiencing it, the mind sees the many good things that come out, the ancient Vedas, the Bible, Search for him for eons, seeking him inwardly, here and now, the mind abides with him. That's uh, the left side of my brain and the right side of my brain making out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that which is interior in people is called heaven, and that which is exterior, earth. The reason heaven means that which is interior in us is that people as regards interior things are an image of heaven. And so a miniature heaven. The Lord's interior human primarily is heaven. For the Lord is the all in all of heaven and thus heaven itself. The exterior person being called the earth follows as a consequence of this. Here also is the reason why the new heaven and the new earth described in the prophets and in the book of Revelation is used to mean nothing other than the Lord's kingdom and every person who is the Lord, who is in the Lord's kingdom, that is, who has the Lord's kingdom within them. Uh, this is, wait, a painting. Uh, that's my, that's my mind clock. With my brain in the middle. So these are some on Zoom. They're asking. These are all your paintings. These are all my paintings. Just to clarify, these ones okay. are huge. They're saying your paintings are amazing. Thank you. Um, so this is my brain, right there. And then I was like thinking about like my nervous system and like how I saw my nervous system from the, from like the inside to the outside. How big is that in real life? Seven, Seven inches. inches. Whoa. Yeah. That is wonderful. The, the other one too. This one is big too. The permanent treasure they comprehend not, seeking only transient things, comprehend too much. Let them gaze within, seeing through the transient, immortal being, doubtless they'll perceive. I like Pierre Millar a lot. He's the he's the founder of Tata Siddhanta. He's beautiful. Um, he wrote a lot. Um, so this is a study on uh the, the homunculus on the right side of my brain. What is the homunculus? <laughs> the homunculus, homunculus means little monkey. Uh -huh. um, oh, <laughs> and great. if you take, um, you take all the areas that have somatic nerve activation in your brain and you map them out and make it into a little body, it doesn't look like a normal body. It looks like you have big hands, big genitals, big lips and face. So it looks like a weird little monkey. So it's called the homunculus. Um, and it's the top of your right parietal lobe right there. And kind of your left, but mostly your right. All human feelings and thoughts arise from the divine love and wisdom that constitute the very essence that is God. The feelings arise from divine love, 
and the thoughts from divine wisdom. Further, every single bit of our being is nothing but feeling and thought. Every single bit is nothing but feeling and thought. These two are like the springs of everything that is alive in us. They are the source of all our life experiences of delight and enchantment. The delight from the prompting of our love and the enchantment from our consequent thought. Oh, wow. I like that enchantment. So this is, this is the meditation on interior. The land of healing lies within, radiant with that happiness blindly sought in a thousand misdirections. Mm -hmm. It needs to be quite clear that it is the inner nature of angels that determines which heaven they are in. The inner nature of angels that determines which heaven they are in. The more the deeper levels have been opened, the more inward the heaven they are in. These are three inner levels of every angel in the spirit and of every person here as well. The people whose third level has been opened are in the central heaven, while the people whose second or first only has been opened are in the intermediate or outmost heaven. The deeper levels are opened by our acceptance of divine good and divine true gifts. Like our brains. People who are actually affected by divine true gifts and let them directly into their lives, into their intentions and therefore into act, are in the central or third heaven located there according to their acceptance of what is good in response to truth. People who do not let such gifts directly into their intentions, but into their memory and from there into their discernment, who so think about it too much, intending <laughs> and doing them as a result of this process are in the intermediate or second heaven. People who live good moral lives though, and believe in the divine with no particular interest in learning are in the outmost or first heaven. We may therefore conclude that the state of our inner natures is what constitutes heaven and that heaven is within each one of us, not outside. I love this quote because, you know, I say, go inward, go inward, go inward, go deeper, go deeper, deconstruct. I love deconstructing. Guard Perry's really mad at me because I love deconstructing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I kept this quote in there because, you know, this is beautiful and important and vital, but it's not going to make you a good person. You can learn all the yoga. You can learn all the meditation techniques. You can go all the way, all the way. And it's not going to make you a good person unless you have all three of these levels uh, completely engaged. So conclusions, the sacred systems of interception can serve as a kind of Rosetta Stone for religions, which may seem wildly divergent from an external perspective. The opening and strengthening of the interceptive sense is a fundamental part of the Swedenborgian mission and the global development of the new church. Sacred systems of interception are powerful tools for e easing suffering and opening up spiritual awareness. They can be mastered and taught. So um, on the chat, uh, Joyce wants to know, do you produce your paintings intuitively or do you plan them out? I do too many paintings to make a definitive statement on that. <laughs> Did you hear that sometimes? <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. The answer yeah. is yes. <laughs> we do. We have about fifteen minutes. Wonderful. I uh, I'm I'm surprised that I was so uh, concise. Very mm -hmm. concise. Can you go back a slide? And just put up something. Like put up one of your paintings. Like yeah. have something pretty up there. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's like individual sphere paintings. 
Um, Swedenborg's ideas of the left and right side of the brain are really cool, but he wasn't consistent through his life. Eventually, I think he got it right. And eventually, I think he got it more right than modern neuroscientists, because what he says is that we have, uh, so let's say I'm, I'm standing here. So this is, this is my brain. Okay. So we have left. Um, so what he says is we have will and understanding. Um, and then outside of that, we have, uh, what does he say? He says action and um, perception. Well, sens yeah. Sensory. Yeah. sensory yeah. Systems. That has to be something else. Perception and action. Which, and I had another slide that I didn't include. But this um, lines up with the uh, uh, autonomic and um, parasympathetic, parasympathetic thank you, uh, nervous system um, very well. And this was completely intuitive because he um, really didn't have much action or didn't have much uh, like real access to even the idea of like localized uh, brain functions. Like that was that was something that he kind of came up with on his own that like not only is the brain a cognitive organ, but there are different distinct parts of the brain that are doing distinctly different things. And this is this is a revolutionary idea because when Descartes starts analyzing thought, he, he basically comes to an impasse with the church where he's like, okay, the church is going to have power over there and the scientists are going to have power over here. And as long as we just have this one tiny pineal gland size connection, then the church can still have authority over salvation. But Swedenborg starts looking at the brain and he starts being like, wait a minute, things that are happening to the brain are affecting how people are behaving, are affecting behavior. So he starts writing about like, you know, people having, you know, neurological anomalies causing things like manic episodes, causing things like alcoholism. And so suddenly this idea of sin that is completely, you know, dependent on the church power structure to decide what is sinful and what is not, is something that is operating, you know, broadly in a distributed way in the natural world. And once you start saying that, people don't have a reason to go to church anymore. <laughs> because whether or not you're in heaven and hell is about whether or not you're doing something that is creating an internal sphere that you can live in, that your body can exist in. Uh, it, in, in a way that's dependent on how you're actually feeling and your own internal intuition. And so maybe church doesn't make you happy. And if you're unhappy in church, you're still in hell. <laughs> and so it's, it's an incredibly dangerous idea because it's a democratizing idea. It's an idea that makes spirituality suddenly accessible spirituality suddenly available to anyone and anything. And it puts your spiritual development back in your own hands because suddenly it, spiritual development is about, you know, living in the world and existing in the world and living in a world that you can make into heaven through, you know, whatever action you're doing, whatever useful service you're performing. And that's a revolution. Uh, so there's one uh, comment in the question. Yeah. Nancy is asking what medium your artwork is. Uh, these ones are oil paint on paper. Okay. 
And then Joyce is commenting, left is logic, right is creativity. And then she says, he would not have had the technology to test his hypothesis. Yeah, and he knew that. And he very clearly states, if I had better technology, I would be able to see further. But what he gets, again, it's, it's getting back to this, this idea of the spiral. And you can know that a spiral is infinite by knowing the curvature of one part of it and extrapolating. And so he's, this is the way that he's thinking. And so when he's using his little dinky blue and hope microscope, which was a bobble of glass on a stick. Wow. Um, <laughs> or no, it was, it was a bobble of glass in front of a stick. And then you put the blob of brain, brain stuff on the stick and you look at it through a blob of glass. And he was able to say, I can see the evidence of repeating fractal patterns going into smaller and smaller scales within this. And I can extrapolate from the patterns that I can already see that you can go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so he's like, I know that there are structures that I'm not able to look at that we will be able to look at in the future. Um, and now, yeah. You have about... I would say like five, six minutes. Really I want to ask about the three kingdoms back in his mm -hmm. early works mm -hmm. and get back into those three kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the mineral kingdom, and the vegetable kingdom. Yeah. Because we are fed yeah. in the world. We are brought forth in the world. The brain and the spiralic relationship. We have a spiral on our head. We have a spiral on our fingers. Yeah. Our whole system works in coordination. Yeah. And so I'm just curious on what what you can relate to this by those three kingdoms. Because tremulations versus electrons, right. electrodes, right? And sparking. Right. It's not system. it's not mechanical tre tremulations. Right. It's, it's electrical os oscillations. That's right. Yeah. Because right. the brain is too mushy. Like it's not like a drum that you can and right. it'll be it'll vibrate. It's like a it's, it'll be like trying to vibrate a bowl right. of jello. Right. Like, <laughs> I understood. I understood. But I'm just curious. Just to take some of the areas of understanding Swedenborg from a physiological. Yeah. And some of the ancient Asian traditions. Right. So so the other thing is he he has a book called that's frequently mistitled as the Animal Kingdom. Right. Animal. It, that's not the title. Right. It's yeah. it's the, the animate domain, yeah. the domain of the soul. Um, so it's not talking about animals, right. it's talking exactly. about animation, exactly. um, about being, being animate. Um, and he has, he, you know, his, his science is not always right. He's convinced that, um, you know, they didn't understand that birds migrate, which seems so obvious to us. It's like the birds disappear in the winter, they went south. Um, but in his time period, they thought that the birds hid underneath the ice. Oh. oh, like uh, like amphibians will yeah. will freeze themselves in some oh climates. My gosh. Um, so they thought they thought, and and he writes this whole thing about the birds disappearing under under sea ice. So Swedenborg is wrong, and and one of the, you know, he's he's right about amazing amounts of stuff, but in order to appreciate the things that he's right about, we have to also be like, Absolutely. you know, yeah, he was at a place in history. Um, and when we do that, he becomes so much more significant because we're able to be like, you know, no, but yes. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that, you know, he, he puts a very strong line between like human cognition and animal cognition. And I think that it's much more blurry um, than mm -hmm. what, he, what he suggested. Because he, he is a humanist at the end of the day. Um, and he's very much, and so the, the thing that I was saying about the brain becoming more folded, and so these areas of, of inter, interoception become more distinct in humans, um, that's true, but those, that kind of folding is already happening in other large brain mammals, oh. um, like whales um, oh. and, uh, you know, higher apes. Um, so it's, uh, it's more like there is something in the actual mechanism <laughs> of how this thing works 
which allows for a soul which has enough interior awareness to have a will and understanding as something that's because if you don't have a sense of the, the difference between internal and external, you're going to be all perception and action. And then as we develop, as we, as we fold, we suddenly have this open up. But what else shows up in here? Language. Mm -hmm. So the earliest people, these most ancient church people, have this opening. They realize there's something inside. And the first thing they see is just light. And then someone's like, we got to give that light a name. And the rest is history. And that's this progression through, through the five churches, this progression through the mind. I think it all goes back to this fact that we are developing, as humans evolve, a sense of interoception. So what is the new church? Finally, we are at a place where we can look inward and we can have abstraction. We can have things from scripture. We can have things from traditional practice. We also have the brain itself. We have the most intimate form of heaven. And the scripture. Just like two more minutes. And so that's my final point. Is that <laughs> there is something, there is something, one of the unique things that the new church gives us is the ability to see that scripture, the Bible, so the biblical scripture, the, what he's talking about here, where he's talking about acceptance of good in response to truth, that layer of the mind can agree with the most abstract and the most embodied, and they can all line up so that <laughs> we can be aware that we are cognitively, consciously existing as embodied beings who are also connected to God. Who are also able to engage with with all of our religious inheritance um, in a way that is hopefully going to make us healthier, happier, and more angelic beings. That's my message for today. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys uh, enjoyed your uh, your little sketching sketching project. Oh, yeah. Okay, take those home. Um, <laughs> if you, uh, <laughs> I see inside your brain. Yeah, butterflies and chaos. Oh, I love it. Excellent.